ready to get back into our Father's Word here at the chapel, the book of Numbers, the fourth book of Moses, the law. And we're going to pick it up today, uh, chapter 26, verse 63. If you'd care to uh, get your Bible and join us, we'd love to have you do that today. Well, we just completed the numbering of Israel in preparation to move into the promised land. Uh, that numbering, two main purposes, they were mustering the troops, because just as this numbering began, you may recall, uh, God instructed Israel to vex the Midianites and the Moabites. In other words, you, you go to war against them. And, and it was kind of a change in the plan, because God had instructed Israel not to fight against the Moabites, Ammonites, or Edomites, because they were Adamic peoples. But... Uh, things changed when Moab seduced Israel along with Median into worshiping their gods. And that brought about a curse, all right. God uh, cursed them. But uh, the second purpose of this numbering, preparing to move into the Promised Land, uh, we are at 1452 B.C. Israel would move into the Promised Land in 1451 B.C. The land would be inherited by the nation of Israel, the count uh, determine how much land each tribe would receive. So with that, let's ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua's precious name. Father, we ask you to open eyes, open ears this day. Numbers chapter 26, verse 63, and it reads, These are they, in other words, those who were numbered, that were numbered by Moses and Eleazar the priest, the high priest, who numbered the children of Israel in the plains of Moab by Jordan near Jericho. And eventually that uh, the Lord would cause the Jordan, even in the flood time of the year, to cease flowing. And Israel, uh, much like they came out of Egypt on dry land as they crossed the Red Sea, they will cross over on dry land, not even so much as getting their shoes wet as they crossed over Jordan into the Promised Land. Of course, Jericho uh, was one of the first victories uh, over the Canaanites once they went into the Promised Land. 64, But among these there was not a man of them whom Moses and Aaron the priest numbered when they numbered the children of Israel in the wilderness of Sinai, that being in the second year that they came out of Egypt. Uh, the first numbering that we saw in chapter 1 in this book of Numbers, uh, and uh, not one individual who was numbered then, and I'm meaning they were 20 years old or upward, would enter the promised land. Why? Verse 65, For the Lord had said of them, They shall surely die in the wilderness. And there was not left a man of them, save Caleb, the son of Jephthah, and Joshua, the son of Nun. And that generation, why were they sentenced to judge to die in the desert? Because of unbelief. They didn't trust in God. God said, I'm going to bring you out of Egypt, and I'm going to give you a land that flows with milk and honey. And what did they do? Well, one, while Moses was up on Sinai, they made a golden calf to worship. We don't want Yahweh to worship. We're going to make a golden calf. Uh, they tempted him twice over the manna. Uh, once over there wasn't any meat. They wanted quail to eat. Uh, once the final straw was that they were going to, it was out and out rebellion. They were going to uh, take Moses out of his position as commander of the nation. And they were going to appoint a captain to lead them back to bondage in Egypt. God was furious with them, and he said, Stand back, Moses, I'm going to destroy them and make a big, bigger, better nation for you. And being the intercessor he was, Moses said, Lord, then you can't do that because then uh, the people of the nations, the Canaanites, who uh, they've heard that you brought these people out of Egypt and we're going to give them the, the promised land, and they're going to say the Lord couldn't do it. So uh, he's going to do it, but it won't be that particular generation. Now, Caleb and, and Joshua both were of the 12 spies who went over into the promised land to investigate what was there. 
and is written in chapter 13 of, of this book of Numbers. And they came back, Caleb did, and said, that land's ours, God gave it to us, let's go. Let's go possess the land. And But the others made up a false report and said, hey, there's giants over there. And, and we were like grasshoppers in their sight. There's no way that we can take that land. And God struck those ten that said that dead. Joshua would eventually join Caleb. And as it's written there in chapter 14 of this book of Numbers, uh, Caleb had a different heart, a different spirit about him, a spirit like God had. So... Caleb, uh, quite a man. He would, Caleb, by the way, at this point, and think there's not one of this generation that's over 60 years old that will go into the promised land because they've been in the wilderness for 40 years except Caleb and Joshua. Caleb, when they crossed over into the promised land, was approximately 77 years old. Uh, Joshua, approximately 92. Uh, Joshua will be... In our next chapter, we'll see appointed to replace Moses as commander of the nation of Israel. Joshua will be given extra years of life, and he'll live to be 110. Chapter 27, we brought up in the numbering of Manasseh in chapter 26, the family of Zelophehad, and the fact that he had five daughters but no sons. And their father, Zelophe, had passes away in the wilderness. And they've just gone through the numbering, and they realized that uh, the numbering is what determined whether you received an inheritance in the promised land or not. Uh, he had no sons, Zelophe had, didn't. He had only daughters. They weren't counted in the numbering. No numbering, no inheritance. That's a problem. What are we going to do? Chapter 27, verse 1. Then came the daughters of Zelophehad, the son of Hefer, the son of Gilead, the son of Machir, Machir being one of the largest and most powerful, uh, powerful tribes or families of, the, of Manasseh, the son of Manasseh, of the families of, of Manasseh, the son of Joseph, and these are the names of his daughters, Mala, which means sickness, Noah, feminine form, uh, meaning movement, and Hogla, meaning partridge, and Milka, you know what Milka, Melchizedek is, means king. This is the female form of that, and when you have queen, and uh, Terza, Terza meaning uh, delightsome or delightsomeness. Now, the masculine form of Noah, actually pronounced in the Hebrew Noach, uh, means uh, rest, uh, as opposed to the female version meaning movement. Verse 2, And they stood before Moses and before Eleazar the priest, and before the princes and all the congregation, or at least as represented by uh, the elders and the family heads, by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, saying, now Zelophe had again had no sons that were counted uh, during the numbering of Israel, and they're going to petition Moses uh, for an inheritance in the promised land. Our father died in the wilderness, and he was not in the company of them that gathered themselves together against the Lord in the company of Korah, but died in his own sin and had no sons. This in his own sin means that he died in sin as the rest of us do. N nothing particularly bad in his record. Uh, and they made the statement that he didn't join with Korah, uh, who tried to usurp uh, the priesthood from Aaron and uh, the command of the nation from Moses. You remember back in chapter 16, and he had 250 that... Uh, showed up at the tabernacle to burn incense to the Lord, and the Lord opened the earth's mouth and swallowed Korah and the two Reubenites who were with him and uh, consumed the 250 with fire that so much that all that was left was their little censers uh, melted, which they beat into plates 
and attached to the altar of burnt offering as a reminder the people, uh, unless you're of the priesthood, don't approach uh, the altar of God. Verse 4, Why should the name of our father be done away from among his family? This done away uh, could be diminished or you could even uh, say cast off, destroyed in other words. Because he hath no son, give unto us, therefore, a possession among the brethren of our father. In other words, the girls are uh, trying to keep their father's name alive, which basically, if there was no inheritance in the promised land, uh, there would be no reason for his name to remain alive. Verse 5. And Moses brought their cause before the Lord. Moses didn't know what to answer, so uh, he did the right thing. If you don't know, ask the Lord, and especially in an important matter such as this. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, verse 7, The daughters of Zelophehad speak right. They, they speak justly. Their, their, their petition and their cause is right. Righteous, maybe even could be said. Thou shalt surely give them a possession of an inheritance among their father's brethren. In other words, among Manasseh. And thou shalt cause the inheritance of their father to pass unto them. And therefore, these uh, ladies became heiresses. And it presented another little problem I kind of alluded to in our last lecture. And that is, if a female was an heiress, and let's, I gave the example of Noah, if she married a man of Judah, she became part of the tribe of Judah. And, but that would not be fair to Manasseh because these inheritances in the land were to remain with the tribe forever. And uh, we'll have a little clarification to this law uh, given in chapter 36, which will be the last chapter of this book of Numbers. Verse 8, And thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, saying, and here we have the law of the inheritance, If a man die and have no son, then ye shall cause his inheritance to pass unto his daughter. And the instruction uh, on the marriage of an heiress will be given in chapter 36, as I said. Verse 9, And if he have no daughter, then ye shall give his inheritance unto his brethren. And the fact that he has no daughter automatically implying that he had no son either, because if he had had a son, the inheritance would have gone to the son first. But in that case, if he didn't have a son, it would go to the daughter and if he didn't have a daughter, then that inheritance, the property, the land, was to go to his brethren. And this brethren, uh, in the original language here, means of the same womb. Verse 10, And if he have no brethren, then ye shall give his inheritance unto his father's brethren. In other words, his uh, uncles on the paternal side, paternal uncles. And the whole purpose of this, of course, was to keep the land in the family name as it was given in the inheritance. Verse 11, And if his father have no brethren, then he shall give his inheritance unto his kinsmen, that is, next to him of his family, and he shall possess it, and it shall be unto the children of Israel a statute of judgment as the Lord commanded Moses. This word statute of judgment uh, could be translated a determining right uh, to claim that land forever. Now, a kinsman is a legal term. Uh, most of you are probably familiar with Joseph of Arimathea was the kinsman redeemer of Jesus Christ. And that's what gave him the determining right uh, to go to uh, the Roman authorities that be and claim the body of Christ after the crucifixion. And that's what this is saying here. If he had no uh, son, he had no daughter, 
Uh, he had no brethren of the womb. Uh, he had no other family. Then it would go to his nearest kinsman, maybe a cousin, something of that nature. But again, the whole idea was to keep the property in that particular family name in that tribe, particularly the tribe. Verse 12, and in the next several verses we see uh, Moses instructed to get his house in order. He's about to die. Verse 12, And the Lord said unto Moses, Get thee up into this mount Abirim, and see the land which I have given unto the children of Israel. Now, don't let this obby rim through you. Many of you probably saying, well, I thought he went up Mount Nebo, or I thought he went up uh, Pisgah and, and looked across Jordan into the promised land because they're on Moab's side, the east side of Jordan at this time. But obby rim, uh, make a note of uh, Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 49 is a range of mountains containing Mount Nebo, which Pisgah is another language name for the same Mount Nebo is the explanation of that. Why won't Moses enter the Promised Land? And you know, Moses, I know a very, very special soul to our Heavenly Father. How do I know that? Look, look what God put on him as a responsibility bringing an entire nation out of bondage in Egypt and leading them to the promised land. Uh, Moses, you know, God knew his heart, that what an intercessor uh, he was, always looking out for the good of the people, never, never really trying to glorify himself or, or take upon himself that he was anything uh, significant like a king might consider himself. Uh, he was always glorifying our Father, but he messed up once, and the Lord is going to tell him what it was. 13, And when thou hast seen it, referring to the promised land, thou also shalt be gathered unto thy people, as Aaron thy brother was gathered. And Aaron, uh, back in chapter 20, we recall, taken to the top, much as Moses would be taken to the top of Pisgah, or Nebo, um, Aaron, along with Moses and Eleazar, uh, went to the top of Mount Hor, H-O-R, and uh, that is where Aaron died. Verse 14, For ye rebelled against my commandment in the desert of Zin, in the strife of the congregation, to sanctify me at the water before their eyes. That is the water of Mirabah, which means strife, in Kadesh, in the wilderness of Zin. And this actually was the second time that they were at Kadesh. I remember they're out kind of just making a big circle in the wilderness, the desert, for 40 years. So the second time they came to Kadesh, though, and God instructed Moses to sanctify the Lord. Uh, by speaking to the rock, and then the Lord was going to bring water forth from the rock because the people were murmuring and crying, we're going to die of thirst out here. But what did Moses do? And I, I pointed out that was is a very important lesson, I believe, for God's election. God instructed Moses to speak to the rock. Uh, what did he do? Well, he and Aaron approached the people with the rock and said, Hear me, you rebels. Must we bring water from this rock? Indicating that God would have trouble bringing water forth from that rock unless he and Aaron helped them. And he, then he struck the rock twice with his own rod, indicating that it was his power, Moses' power, that brought forth water out of the rock not God's power. And the lesson for God's elect, when God says, speak, you be prepared to speak. The Holy Spirit speaking through you when you're delivered up uh, before the synagogues of Satan. If he doesn't give you something to say, keep your mouth shut. Because to do otherwise, beloved, if you are his elect, you are risking committing the unpardonable sin. Verse 15, and Moses spake unto the Lord, saying, you know, the people uh, had become totally dependent 
on Moses. Uh, not all of them. Uh, it was obvious over the years of the decades they were wandering around in the desert. But by this time, no doubt, the people totally depended on Moses. And, and, and being the good leader that he was, he is t about to petition the Lord to appoint someone to replace him, knowing that the people are going to need a leader. Verse 16, Let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, in other words, the giver of all life and breath, set a man over the congregation. Moses knew that they were going to need a leader. They were doing bad enough with good leadership. He knew how bad things would have gotten without that leadership. 17, which may go out before them and which may go in before them. This is a, a Hebraism, a figure of speech that means uh, to as they go in and out of their daily activities, their daily conduct, and which may bring them in that the congregation of the Lord be not as sheep which have no shepherd. And Moses certainly a type for the shepherd, referring to uh, Jesus Christ. And, and you know, if you, if you don't have a shepherd, what you have are a lot of lost sheep. And that situation has happened more than one occasion. Matthew uh, chapter 15, verse 24, uh, Jesus himself said, I am sent uh, but to the lost sheep of Israel. And they had no shepherd. And what Moses is asking God to do is to appoint a shepherd so that the sheep aren't lost, concerned about the people always. 18, And the Lord, this is Yahweh, said unto Moses, Take thee Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, the Ruach, and lay thine hand upon him. Now, Joshua in the Hebrew language is Yeshua, a term, a name that you hear us use quite frequently on the program, and it's the Hebrew name from, from which comes the English word Jesus. And Joshua also a type for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, for it would be He that delivers the people of Israel into the promised land. Uh, Joshua, you may remember, this is not the first time his name has come up in the book of Numbers. In chapter 11, uh, verse 28, uh, Moses uh, had asked the Lord for some help. I mean, it was about to drive him nuts having that many people, and he was having to hear all the complaints, all the problems, make all the judgments, in other words. And God told him to choose out 70 men that he knew well and that the people respected for them to help him judge the nation of Israel. And you may recall what happened. He had 68 of the 70 Moses did at the tabernacle, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and they began to prophesy. And, but there were two uh, that were not present but in the city. And Joshua was in their presence when the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they began to prophesy. And Joshua was a servant of Moses at that time, no doubt a young man at that time. And he went running to Moses, do you remember, and said, these men are prophesying. That's your and Aaron's job. Make them stop. And Moses said, Are you jealous for me, Joshua? You know, I would to God that all these people, the Spirit of God, would come upon them and they would prophesy because it would make his job a whole lot easier. Joshua chosen. And notice who chose Joshua. In this case, it wasn't Moses choosing out 70 of well-known and trusted men. God chose Joshua, 19, and set him before Eleazar the priest and before all the congregation and give him a charge in their sight. In other words, the consecration of Joshua uh, to lead the nation. You could, the, the term commander uh, probably fits in this case. 20, 
and thou shalt put some of thine honor. In other words, your uh, dignity or your majesty, Moses, upon him, that all the congregation of the children of Israel may be obedient. This word obedient, a Hebrew word that many of you are probably familiar with, shama, it means to hear intelligently. So that is what shama means. And, and also that the people might trust in Joshua. When they, they, they trusted, for the most part, there were some exceptions, of course, but the people trusted Moses. And by witnessing this consecration, they knew that Moses was getting ready to leave the world. He'd been told to get his house in order earlier in this chapter. I'm sure the other people knew it and knew that he would not be entering the promised land either. Uh, so they knew what was coming. But all of this done to give uh, credentials, probably a good word, to Joshua. 21, And he shall stand before Eleazar the priest, who shall ask counsel for him after the judgment or decision of Urim before the Lord at his word. And, of course, this would be the Urim and Thummim, uh, just abbreviated here. The, the Thummim is always connected to the Urim. It's, it's like a hand and a glove. Shall they go out, and at his word they shall come in. In other words, again, in their day-to-day -day conduct and, and, and actions. Both he and the children of Israel with him, even all the congregation, important decisions uh, to be taken to the Lord and the decision to be made through the Urim and Thummim. Uh, there's a, quite a bit of controversy among the scholars as to whether Joshua had as much authority as Moses had or not. Uh, they, some point to the fact that uh, God instructed him, you know, rather than making the decisions yourself, uh, when something major comes up, you go to Eleazar, the high priest, and have him inquire of me as to what should be done. Whereas Moses, on the other hand, basically uh, had the face of God any time that he wanted. Remember back in chapter 12, uh, Miriam and Aaron complained that the Lord spoke directly with Moses, but he didn't speak directly with them. Uh, that kind of, of, of um, logic is, I think, what goes in behind some of the scholars uh, thinking Joshua did not have as much authority. Verse 22, And Moses did as the Lord commanded him, for the most part a faithful servant. And he took Joshua and set him before Eleazar the priest and before all the congregation, before the heads of the families, the princes of the tribes, the elders as representatives of the people of Israel. And he laid his hands upon him and gave him a charge as the Lord commanded by the hand of Moses. So kind of the much as Eleazar had taken on the responsibilities of the high priesthood when Aaron passed away, uh, we see uh, Joshua uh, taking on the responsibilities that Moses had uh, before he was to pass away. Now, the actual death of Moses is written of in Deuteronomy chapter 32, uh, verses 48 through 52. And we don't actually have the death of Moses recorded in the book of Numbers. Chapter 28 and 29, we come to the law of offerings. Uh, going to be restated. Some of it's new. Uh, in chapter uh, 28, we're going to see that the offerings that were to be made on the Sabbath are given for the first time. But, and I think it's appropriate <clears throat> that the Lord restates uh, these laws at this point. I mean, here these people have been wandering around in the wilderness for 40 years. Now they are finally going to enter the promised land. Now some of the sacrifices and the feast, God had already instructed you do them every year, even in the wilderness. Passover, you're to celebrate the Passover. But you consider the daily sacrifices. There had to be instances 
I would think, when it was not practical for the people to make their daily offerings. Uh, recall the priests were required to prepare the altar of burnt offering by wrapping it in a certain way and preparing it to be transported as the nation moved from one campsite uh, to another encampment site. And it would be impractical to stop and unwrap everything that had been prepared to be moved every morning to offer the morning sacrifice and every evening to offer the evening sacrifice. So uh, I think God restating here, okay, you're getting ready to move into the promised land. Uh, I'm going to remind you what is required as far as my offerings. And it was up to the priests to protect the rights of the Lord. We won't get far, but let's get started. Chapter 28, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, 1452 B.C., uh, the year that Miriam, Aaron, and Moses would all pass away, and they would be gathered back to their fathers. 1451 B.C., uh, Israel crosses Jordan into the Promised Land. Verse 2, Command the children of Israel, and say unto them, My offering, or Corban, sacrificial gift you could think of, and my bread for my sacrifice is made by fire. For a sweet savor unto me shall ye observe to offer unto me uh, in their due season at uh, their appointed times. And uh, what we're going to see here is the daily sacrifices uh, restated, but uh, the question was coming up, well, okay, we have the daily sacrifices, and then we have the feast days and the Sabbaths, and there are a prescribed number of sacrifices we're supposed to make on those days. Are we supposed to make the daily sacrifice in addition to uh, the feast days prescribed? And what we're going to see is Israel, uh, through their sacrifices, sanctifying their lives, body, soul, and spirit to Yahweh. And, uh, the graduated or increasing number of sacrifices that the people made simply intensified uh, that sanctification. Verse 3, And thou shalt say unto them, This is the offering made by fire which ye shall offer unto the Lord. Two lambs of the first year without spot day by day, for a continual burnt offering. And this, again, the daily sacrifice, one to be offered in the morning, one in the evening. Let's go another verse or two, and then we'll stop. The one lamb shalt thou offer in the morning, and the other lamb shalt thou offer at even. And in addition to that, verse 5, and a tenth part of an ephath of flour for a meat offering, minka in the Hebrew, mingled with the fourth part of a hen of beaten oil. Beaten meaning pure uh, oil, always significant or uh, symbolic of the Holy Spirit. This flower, of course, was uh, the purest flower because this was a type for the sacrifice for one and all time, uh, Jesus Christ. And I guess we'll stop there for the day. I don't want to rush th this. And we'll come back and cover the other uh, sacrifices that God prescribed. And again, God getting Israel ready to move into the promised land finally after wandering in the wilderness for 38 years. Can you imagine how excited uh, that younger generation was, the ones who were 19 and younger at the first numbering, that finally they're going to get to have their homes that God promised to them in a land that truly flowed with milk and honey. We'll come back in our next lecture. We've got a short message. We'll ask you to listen a moment, won't you please?